All right, good evening all, and welcome to the Alaska Eating Disorders Echo. This echo is jointly provided by the Alaska Eating Disorder Alliance and UAA Center for Human Development uh, Project ECHO. Funding for the Eating Disorders Project ECHO has been provided by the Alaska Community Foundation, State of Alaska, and the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority. My name is Erin, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm an ECHO coordinator with the Center for Human Development's Project ECHO. Our, our biweekly sessions offer a forum for Alaskan interdisciplinary healthcare professionals to connect with eating disorder experts. This is the second of six sessions running from September through November, and each session will include a didactic presentation from a subject matter expert, followed by a Q&A and case presentation, which will offer an opportunity to engage critically and collaboratively with illustrative examples of important and noteworthy topics related to eating disorders and their treatment. Uh, we are really happy to announce that our series has been approved for continuing education credits and participants can claim one and a half credit hours per session of this ECHO series. And in order to claim those credits, you must attend our live session uh, at least 90% of the full session time and you must complete an evaluation form after which you'll be redirected to receive and download confirmation of your continuing education credits. At the end of our session today, a link to that evaluation will be provided in the chat box, so please keep an eye out for it. I also encourage uh, all of our participants, even if they're not claiming credit hours, to fill out that survey as it's a great opportunity for us to gauge uh, how we're doing and how we might be able to improve. All right, before we jump in to today's presentations, a few Zoom reminders. If your internet connection does not support audio, you can find a phone number to call in the chat box along with a meeting ID. Closed captions are automatically generated and those can be enabled by selecting the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you are able to, please take a moment to turn on your camera so that we can all get to know each other a little bit better. The camera on the camera icon is on the lower left of your Zoom screen. And we do ask that you keep your microphone muted during our presentations and when you're not speaking. And you can mute and unmute yourself by selecting the microphone icon on the lower left of the screen or by pressing star six if you're calling in via phone. <clears throat> All right, and so whether or not you've joined in ECHOs before, it's important to know that engagement with a group is integral to the all teach, all learn philosophy, which underpins our program. And so we encourage everyone to ask questions and make comments during our session by utilizing the chat box or when appropriate by unmuting yourself and sharing directly with the group. We do ask that you use the raise hand feature as that allows us to <clears throat> to just have some order uh, during our session and make sure that um, folks aren't speaking um, over each other. So thank you for that. And you're also welcome to private chat, uh, the session host, myself, any of um, my colleagues whose um, names begin with Echo or any of our hub team members who are identified uh, with hub in front of their name, <clears throat> if you'd like your questions shared anonymously. All right, so to help build connections and foster participation throughout our ECHO, we do like to start each session with introductions. However, in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and do those introductions by the chat box. So participants and hub team members, please introduce yourself um, in the chat box by sharing your name, role, organization, where you're joining us from and what you hope to get out of this ECHO. Also for folks when um, appropriate during the session, whether you're presenting or sharing a question, please go ahead and uh, reintroduce yourself with your name. That's uh, really helpful for those who might not have access to, uh, might be joining us by phone and not able to see who's speaking. All right, and uh, please note that the opinions of our hub team and presenters are their own and do not necessarily represent those of Akita, UAA, or any ECHO sponsor. Additionally, Project ECHO is not HIPAA compliant, and therefore no protected health information is to be shared or displayed at any time. So thank you to everyone for following those guidelines. And lastly, I'd like to take a brief moment to pause for a land acknowledgement. Though this is a virtual space, our ECHO team is joining you from Anchorage. And as such, we want to thank the Denina people for their stewardship of the lands, water, air, and all life that sustains us within the traditional lands of the Takatnu Cook Inlet region. 
We respect the Dena'ina cultural ways and their homelands and strive to be good neighbors. All right, so now I'll turn the session over to the Akita team to share a bit about the vision that's driving this initiative, the purpose of our ECHO, what's on today's agenda, as well as to offer some reminders about best practices and language when engaging in today's discussion. Thank you, Erin. I'm Beth Rose. I'm one of the co-founders of the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance. I'm thrilled to welcome you all this evening and to see so many of you. Our goal for this Project ECHO is that together we can grow capacity within our local healthcare system to better understand, diagnose, and treat eating disorders in Alaska and in the communities that you all are from if you're not in Alaska. During our time together, we'll be learning from the elements of the formal ECHO as well as from this learning community. This is an open space where all voices and all bodies are welcome. We encourage you to be mindful and to seek ways to use inclusive, non-stigmatizing language. Let me start with a broad outline of this evening's agenda. We will begin with a didactic presentation provided by one of our Hub Team members, Dr. Melissa O'Neill, titled Identifying Eating Disorders Across the Lifespan, uh, screen Eating Disorders Screening and Assessment Tools for Children, Adolescents, and Adults, and this will be followed by a question and answer period moderated by our hub team of subject matter experts. And then we will hear a case presentation um, from Anchorage-based family physician, Dr. Jill Gaskell. But first, let me provide you with a brief introduction of tonight's presenter, Dr. O'Neill. Dr. Melissa O'Neill is a licensed professional, professional counselor in the state of Alaska. She holds a certified eating disorder specialist supervisor credential, as well as a certificate in clinical military counseling. After receiving her master's in counseling in New Mexico, Melissa spent eight years working in eating disorder treatment centers in various capacities, including marketing and outreach, clinical assessment, admissions, group therapy facilitation, and clinical management. She received her doctorate in counselor education and supervision from Adams State University and currently works full-time as clinical fac faculty in the School of Counselor Education at Adams. Melissa is a nationally recognized speaker, community advocate, and researcher in the field of eating disorders. In Alaska, she has worked as an outpatient clinician with coastal wellness and counseling, offering supervision to individuals seeking their certified eating disorders specialist credential. And she partners with us at the Alaska Eating Disorders Alliance to provide clinical consultation on a monthly basis to providers who treat individuals experiencing eating disorders. Please help me welcome tonight's guest present presenter, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, all right, let me share my slides with you all. Bear with me for a moment. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, great. Thanks. All right, so I'm working dual monitor, so um, hopefully you don't mind my kind of back and forth that I'm doing here. All right, so hello and welcome to our second ECHO session. Uh, my name is Melissa O'Neill and I'm coming to you from Anchorage, Kentucky, having recently moved here from Anchorage, Alaska. I'm a licensed professional counselor in Alaska and I feel it's so important to continue working alongside Akita to offer eating disorders advocacy and education in Alaska. So tonight we'll be talking about identifying eating disorders across the lifespan, specifically eating disorder screening and assessment for children, adolescents, and adults. All right, our learning objectives for tonight uh, will be for learners to be able to access and discuss screening and assessment tools specific for eating disorders, articulate appropriate questions to ask during clinical interviews for eating disorders, and discuss eating disorder risk factors specific to various age groups. And I want to just provide a note that generally I'll be referring to individuals experiencing eating disorders as clients, as that um, aligns with my profession um, rather than using patients um, or otherwise. All right, we're going to begin by talking about a few of the most common eating disorder screening and assessment tools available. 
One thing to note is that assessment measures for eating disorders did not exist until the late 20th century. So this is still a relatively new practice. However, um, I think it was Dr. Lauren Muehlheim who I first heard say, if you should see patients who eat, you see patients who have eating disorders. It's important to start out with some statistics on who we are seeing. It's estimated that around 30 million people in the U.S. will have experienced an eating disorder in their lifetime, though um, this number is likely much higher. From the research, we know that approximately a third of individual, individuals with eating disorders are men and two-thirds are women. However, this statistic does not support gender nonconforming, non-binary, and trans individuals. Folks in the LGBTQIA community are at a higher risk for developing eating disorders. And while there's a small but growing body of research underway, we still lack adequate research and resources to support their needs appropriately. As you can see, looking at this graphic I'm sharing, binge eating disorder and other eating disorders, such as other specified feeding and eating disorder and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder are the most prevalent eating disorders. A common misnomer is that anorexia or bulimia are the most prevalent, and they're certainly the most widely researched, but in fact, they make up the minority of eating disorder presentations. Uh, and finally, what we so often see in outpatient settings are considered subclinical eating disorders or disordered eating. These folks are still at risk for experiencing medical complications and are at risk of developing an eating disorder, but they're often overlooked and are vastly underrepresented. What we know is that approximately three quarters of people will not seek treatment for their eating disorder for various reasons, including limited access to care. And this is a place where the idea of not being sick enough begins and things can really snowball. So moving into our process, I'm going to move through the general steps of screening and assessment uh, for eating disorders, diagnosis, and treatment. So step one includes using screening tools, and these are the three most common tools available. They're all available free of charge and quite frequently used across treatment disciplines. Uh, and honestly, if you use anything, um, I would suggest using the SCOF questionnaire. The SCOF questionnaire was developed in 1999 and it includes five questions indicative of the acronym SCOF. And they include, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry you have lost control over how much you eat? Have you recently lost more than one stone or 14 pounds in a three month period? Do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you are too thin? And would you say that food dominates your life? So to score, you use one point for every yes answer and a score of greater than or equal to two yeses indicates an eating disorder is likely present. The scoff is most appropriate for adolescents and older. The eating disorder examination questionnaire was derived from the eating disorder examination assessment, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it was developed to be a faster and reliable screener for eating disorders and is appropriate for anyone ages 14 and older. It's a 28 item self-report questionnaire focused on recall from the past 28 days or approximately one month. It also requests individuals to report their current height, weight, and um, for cis women asks, um, or for women asks about uh, last known menstrual period and contra contraceptive use. It uses four subscales, including restraint, eating concern, shape concern, and weight concern. And there's also a variation of the EDEQ that has been validated for children ages seven to 18, which is called the CH EDEQ8. And finally, the Eating Attitudes Test, or the EAT26, is a 26 item self report inventory measuring. ED related thoughts and behaviors under three subscales, which are dieting, bulimia and food preoccupation, and oral control. This is commonly used among anyone 14 and older. It's easily accessible and also has an adaptation for children ages seven and older called the CHEAT. All right, moving into assessments. 
Um, the eating disorder examination is considered the gold standard of assessments for adults experiencing eating disorders. There's also a variation for adolescents 14 and older called the EDEA. The EDE has been updated to reflect the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, which um, unfortunately not all other assessments have done. This is a more intensive inventory. It's an investigator-based measure rather than self-report, and it can take anywhere from approximately, approximately 45 to 75 minutes on average to complete. The EDE focuses on recall from the past 28 days, and it's aimed at providing a diagnosis with its results. And then the eating disorder inventory, or the EDI-3, is a shorter self-report measure that takes approximately 20 minutes to administer. Um, so considering uh, potential time restraints, this one might be um, helpful to administer. The target population is for cis women ages 13 to 53. Um, so there is, there is some, a little bit of gender limitation there and includes 12 scales that yields six composites consisting of eating disorder risk along with other related psychological risk factors. So in addition to the more generalized screening and assessment tools, you might want to consider diagnostic specific tools if you know or suspect a certain presentation. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to walk through these screening and assessment tools rather quickly, but they're worth exploring for your clients. The Bulet R measures for bulimia and binge eating disorder. Um, it's been found to be reliable for college students, namely transition age youth but has low cross-cultural validity and could use some sprucing from a multicultural lens. The Binge Eating Disorder Screener 7 is a seven item tool derived from the Binge Eating Scale, which is a 16 item self-report measure. Both are suggested for adults and there are variations for children and adolescents. The NIAS is utilized to screen for ARFID, and I suggest using this in conjunction with an OCD or an anxiety screener. It's been validated for individuals ages 10 and older. The compulsive exercise test is a 24 item self-report measure aimed at measuring com compulsivity, affect regulation, weight and shape driven exercise and exercise rigidity. This can be used with adolescents um, through uh, adulthood. And finally, the eating disorder assessment for men is a 50 item questionnaire developed to address thoughts and behaviors more specific to male eating disorders presentations. Um, and then I also suggest just considering uh, inventories for co-occurring diagnoses, um, common, co commonly co-occurring with eating disorders, such as anxiety, depression, OCD, personality disorders, or suicidal ideation. Um, I, I wanted to uh, include this graphic as well. As of 2012, eating disorders diagnoses in men had increased by 250%, and that number has only risen in the past decade. This table indicates additional assessment measures that have been validated to be used with men, and it's only a, a small sample. I've also included, uh, linked an article written by a colleague um, and friend of mine, Dr. Zach Rawlings, that discusses some of the specific challenges related to body image, body dysmorphia, and eating disorders in gay men, which is a group at heightened risk for developing eating disorders. So next we're gonna move on to what to ask during the clinical interview. And step three is the clinical interview that should always coincide, coincide with screening and assessment tools. The conversation of the clinical interview may vary depending on your discipline, um, your areas of specialty, why the person is presenting for treatment, and whether or not it's known that they have an eating disorder. Generally, if it's someone brand new to the idea that they may have an eating disorder, I'll ask them questions in a way that's aimed at reducing fear and shame, which are two factors that can stifle a person's willingness to discuss their eating disorder. So I might ask questions like, how would you describe your relationship with food? Have you made any changes to your diet recently? Are there any foods you avoid? Are there any foods that, that feel unsafe or safe to eat? 
Do you ever feel like you can't stop eating? Do you ever feel bad or guilty after you eat? Um, or do you ever feel like you need to get rid of food or exercise because of something you've eaten? And um, on a personal note, I struggled with an eating disorder throughout my teens and early 20s. I never once had a medical or mental health provider ask me these questions, nor did they provide any sort of screening for an eating disorder. And I've been recovered for well over 10 years now, but I often wonder what it would have been like to have someone show genuine care and concern for my eating and exercise habits and debilitating body image distress. Um, keep in mind that clients may lie, deceive, or negate information about their eating disorder, and that is totally understandable. Their eating disorder will be determined to protect itself, and sometimes at all costs. The way we engage in conversation plays a huge role in our ability to connect with our clients and gather pertinent information to help them. Be sure to ask about changes in eating behaviors, activity levels, um, mood changes. Don't gloss over behaviors or the, the I'm fines. Um, here I've linked in this little graphic, I've linked a quick video of one of Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani's metaphors about the house on fire in which She's essentially saying that our clients often appear fine, um, so we don't ask or intervene. In fact, it, it could even appear that they're, they're crushing it between getting straight A's, um, involvement in a wide variety of activities, exercising frequently, reigning in accomplishments, but what's not seen is how much they're suffering beneath the surface. And if we're agreeable with those accomplishments alone, this can inadvertently reinforce the eating disorder. So it's helpful to focus on timelines as well and refer to the calendar. Ask about longer term changes as well as more recent timeframes like the past month or week. I always get a 24 hour food recall to assess for real time engagement. Be sure to ask follow up questions. If they say um, something like, I ate a bowl of cereal for breakfast, ask specifics, what kind of cereal, how much, and like, is it this, does the bowl look like this? Is it, is it a handful? Did you finish the bowl of cereal? What kind of milk? Are these safe foods for you? Um, what did it feel like afterwards? And last, using motivational interviewing skills can be helpful to show that you're being present with them, validate how they're feeling and encourage them to share more. So this leads me to the oh no no list. So for anyone who's ever watched Parks and Rec, you'll recognize Tom Haverford here who created the oh no no list. So these are things not to do. Do not skip assessing suicidal ideation and self-harm. SI and SH are two of the most predominant co-occurring issues with eating disorders, and suicide is one of the leading causes of death for people experiencing eating disorders. As I mentioned in the previous slide, please don't gloss over the assessment or questions and let them speak. Uh, their story and the story they're telling themselves is highly relevant. This includes family members. Do not fill in the blanks on your own or ask leading questions. Um, again, personally, I've had providers um, ask questions like, you eat healthy, right? You exercise regularly? Checkbox, checkbox. Uh, stress level's normal, but you're managing fine. Yep, yep, yep. Just kind of like moving, moving the process along. This gives our clients an automatic out and they won't have to divulge anything more. Uh, which is kind of a, a, a point in the eating disorders direction, again, inadvertently. And finally, we need to dig into our own biases and be aware that our clients' beliefs and biases are in the room as well as our own. Diet culture mentality is everywhere, telling us how our bodies should look, what healthy means, and preventing us from seeing issues that otherwise might be obvious. Uh, one thing we can do is be aware of our language and how common it is to use eating food and, and body related euphemisms like, you have a lot on your plate, let me weigh in here, um, or the right fit. So instead, try, you have a lot going on, I imagine that feels overwhelming, or I'd like to add my opinion, or let's see if this applies. 
All right, briefly, I wanna cover the format uh, for the assessment process. No matter the discipline, I'd suggest starting with some sort of screening and assessment tools and the clinical interview. This helps to maximize accuracy of the presentation, your diagnosis and treatment planning. Clients will need a medical appointment no matter the severity of the eating disorder. On the next slide, I, I've included the National Eating Disorder Association's recommendations for what needs to be gathered at that appointment. So I'll talk about that in a moment. Once initial information is gathered, consider who needs to be added to the multidisciplinary team, whether that's an individual counselor, psychologist, family therapist, primary care provider, psychiatrist, dietitian, um, or other specialists. It's ideal if the team can meet and set goals and boundaries together, but in outpatient, we know that isn't always realistic uh, right away, especially. So I know we're really doing our best to touch base and um, ideally setting a schedule for connecting moving forward. Maybe that's, hey, let's try to touch base for five minutes every month, or this is based on treatment goals. Maybe you're, maybe you're needing to connect every other week um, so that it's, it's typically individually based. I've spoken with providers um, anywhere from five to 30 to even 60 minutes, depending on our availability. And this is something I recommend building into your admin hours if possible. I really don't wanna encourage um, working outside of our normal hours. I know everybody is working really hard um, and doing amazing work. And sometimes a phone call on your way home or after kiddos are in bed or maybe before you turn on the TV for the evening is the best time to connect. All right, um, NIDA and the Academy for Eating Disorders have provided extensive guidelines for what information to gather during a medical appointment. They recommend a physical exam, measuring body temperature and pulse, orthostatic blood pressure, labs and a dental exam if purging suspected to establish a diagnosis and recommendations for care. Um, if you're a mental health provider and your client does not have access to a medical provider or a dietitian, um, you can keep a blood pressure cuff for orthostatic vitals and a scale for blind weights. Um, they, they even make scales that don't show the numbers on them and the information gets linked to an app which can get sent to you um, rather than, than visible to the client. However, my personal preference is to keep these practices in the medical and nutrition providers lanes so we're not blurring the lines. And um, there are some, I've, I've worked with um, some very amazing providers in Alaska who do this and do a great job at um, providing these exams. And um, I've linked the, the APA level of care guidelines, um, NIDA's recommendations and um, AED's guidelines for medical care for your use after this presentation. Uh, there's a group of experts that's currently revising the APA level of care guidelines, so be on the lookout for that document, hopefully um, coming in the next few months. All right, and finally, I want to go over some specific risk factors to look out for between and among age groups. Common to all age groups um, is social isolation. These are risk factors I'm talking about. Um, social isolation, trauma history, mood lability, preoccupation with food and weight, changes in food intake, activity levels, and physical health. Um, normal life transition points such as puberty, changing schools, job changes, moving, holidays, relationship changes, maybe becoming a parent, losing a loved one, um, on and on. These are times when eating disorder risk is significantly increased. Folks might also become more anxious or perfectionistic, um, or they might be more impulsive or um, maybe more explosive in behaviors. Uh, or affect. In children, keep an eye on changes in food behaviors like throwing away their lunch, hiding food, socioeconomic factors that could lead to food insecurity, for example, depressed or anxious mood, um, and falling off or plateauing on their growth charts. In adolescents, be on the lookout for social media use, um, 
preoccupation with body image, new food rules or rituals, a change in activity levels, and for girls late onset of, onset of menstruation or changes to their otherwise normal cycle. In transition age youth, uh, pay attention to the time between graduating high school and entering college or entering the workforce. Social media use, again, changes in social circles or connections, new food rules or rituals or exercise routines. Uh, for example, this might be a time when someone decides to start cutting out food groups for various reasons, um, like becoming vegetarian, and then that can progressively become more limited over time. Among adults, again, pay attention to significant life changes or transitions and financial stressors, fertility, sexual health, and parenthood, digestive and hormonal issues, impulsivity, um, workaholism, et cetera. And lastly, older adults are among the most ignored and even the most normalized group in terms of eating disorder presentation, behaviors, et cetera. For example, we might brush off changes in eating behaviors as quote normal because metabolism naturally slows down or taste buds change or weaken. Um, menopause, retirement, financial stressors, again, digestive and hormonal issues, grief and loss can all be access points for an eating disorder. So with that, I want to wrap up uh, by saying you are not expected to dramatically change everything that you're doing uh, in your practice by paying attention, creating conversation, and adding assessment tools little by little. You'll be making a huge impact. So I've included my references for re your review, and thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Neil. That was a very um, action-packed uh, uh, set of information there. Um, we've had a lot of people ask about, you know, links to these. So we will be sure to upload links to actual screening um, tools uh, so people can use them because that was a frequently asked question in the um, in the chat. Um, and some of the other things that were asked, you mentioned about the specific um, screening or assessment tool for, for males. How effective are SCOF and some of the other ones that you mentioned for addressing um, uh, issues, men's eating um, uh, issues? Is that, can they use that as well or do they really need to use one specifically for men? Um, this, I would say the scoff is less, um, gender dependent is, a, I guess the word I would say it's, it's, it is more gender inclusive. However, it's, it's very brief and it can, it should just be used as like a very basic screening tool to identify a, an eating disorder is likely present. So I think this could be used for individuals of all genders. Great. Is a very specific question, which is um, how soon after discharge from inpatient would the 24 hour food recall be appropriate if they're not yet working on uh, IADL of food prep on their own for pediatric slash adolescent patients, concerns over triggers. This is really encouraging to hear, to push past the I'm fine. Um, in rural outpatient, I may be too mindful not to push too hard in clinical interviews or sessions because travel and finding resources in general is so tricky and involves complicated travel and weather issues and such. So I guess the question is, you know, there's a couple of things here. One is about how much to, you know, really push, especially in a rural community, and the other about discharge and how soon you can really, you know, talk to the patient about food recall. Yeah. So in terms of discharge, hopefully um, you'll be getting discharge paperwork too. So you'll be able to see what, um, what the individual has been able to complete in terms of their meal plan and have those notes. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. Um, and so it, it can be helpful to, um, to, to, continue, to still get that inventory. And I might actually defer to some of our dietitian hub team members and see how they would, um, what, how they would opine on this. I'm curious, um, Grace or Brooke, if you have a, anything that you would add to this. And also Jessica Setnick. 
And Jessica, yes, thank you. I, I saw their faces. Thanks, Jenny. I can jump in. Um, so for a patient who's coming from inpatient and they're discharging, the 24 hour food recall would be helpful just to know what they were getting in the clinical setting, but I would also make sure to definitely address what the food behaviors were like at home prior to admission um, so that you're getting a full picture of what they were doing and then how they changed it. So this is Jessica Setnick. Um, I would just add to that, um, that unfortunately this is one of those areas where you know, inpatient is from Mars and outpatient is from Venus. And sometimes there is a gap in time and a gap in preparation for someone coming from one level of care to another. And unfortunately, um, it, it may be really very important to find out how long is going to elapse and make sure someone has a plan for that period of time. Because in my experience, on the outpatient side, I remember there was a treatment center where everyone that came home from that treatment center had shrimp kebabs on Tuesday night on their meal plan, and no one actually knew how to make shrimp kebabs. They only had shrimp kebabs on Tuesday night because that's what they were served when they were in treatment. And it just kind of became a joke, like, oh, well, you know, shrimp kebabs on Tuesday. Um, and unfortunately, it puts some individuals in a position where they haven't eaten appropriately in however many days that's been since they've been discharged from treatment. So if anyone here listening is on the inpatient side, I would just say that outpatient dietitian or outpatient provider would really appreciate communication from you as well as maybe just sort of an emergency what to eat in the next three days until you meet with your outpatient provider. Um, you know, what is sort of the, the basics? Because it does sometimes seem like someone's eating so well and so appropriately in that supportive setting, but they're not necessarily able to continue doing that once they leave that supportive setting. So there, there is, a, unfortunately, a gap that I think a lot of us have probably seen. And I think as a community, we could all be doing better at, at sort of trying to keep that from occurring. Thanks, There's another, go ahead. Dr. I was Dr. just gonna address the, the second part of the question that you had, um, had asked Beth in terms of how much to, to push or how much um, to try to gather more information. Um, and Again, I might, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Gaskill and you might have some ideas about this as well. Um, and I, I think knowing that a lot of a lot of what we've done as providers in Alaska is we've had to do a lot of patchwork. We've had to um, to kind of lean on each other and pull in information when and how we can to support our clients and patients. And um, so it's almost this. I, I don't know if this is a great answer, but it's almost more about how we ask versus what um, more and more and more we ask and conveying our genuine concern, con conveying our genuine compassion, um, knowing that we might not get all the information. Um, and it's very common that we won't. So continuing to follow up. If we, if, if we suspect that there's something going on, um, then keeping that person on our radar is going to be really helpful. Would you add anything that to that, Dr. Gaskell? No. Okay. Okay. We have another question. That's um, is how do you tease out in a girl, in a, a, a female adolescent, what part is puberty and what might be an eating disorder, especially related to weight gain? The question was how much is too much. Mm -hmm. Um. I would probably ask more uh, behaviorally focused questions. Um, there are, and we can, in terms of, I mean, obviously bodies, body size, weight, I mean, bodies fluctuate at that age um, significantly. And so there are, it's, we're not only focusing on weight, uh, we're focusing on thoughts, behaviors, motivation for recovery, um, I, I, so I think that that's kind of how I would, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Cuellar and I'm wondering if there's anything that you would add to that as well. 
Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, when I, when I talk to patients and families, um, I think there can be a hyperfixation on getting to like a goal weight or a goal number. And I just always explain it. it's, it's a number of things. It's behaviors, it's thoughts, um, it's symptoms, it's like return to menses, it's that's uh, physiologically appropriate. Um, and the other thing that just kind of struck my mind um, regarding this question is also just looking historically um, at what weight, weight trends have been. Um, and as much as I don't like growth curves, this is actually where I think it does become helpful um, to see, you know, what somebody's growth curve has looked like in the years prior to the eating disorder onset and having an idea of where you're going in terms of goals for that. Um, so, yeah. I think that's Thank you. I have a few more questions here. Um, the question is, are these screening tools appropriate for childhood trauma of food insecurity? And how is trauma taken into account? Is it better to do counseling first or work with a dietitian? Mm. Um, when an eating disorder is present at, at all, if, if and when at all possible, I recommend a, a counselor and a dietitian and a medical provider are all working in sync. Um, in terms of, I'm looking at the, the question, screening tools appropriate for childhood trauma, food insecurity. Uh, I think there, I think these particular screening tools are helpful. Um, and we might need to add, um, specific trauma, um, trauma screening and assessment tools and ask more in, especially once we get into like getting into therapy in particular, um, speaking more to that. I, I think in terms of, I'm not, I'm not really sure about assessments for, um, childhood trauma, food insecurity specifically, I would probably have to look into more of those. If anybody on the hub team has any ideas or suggestions, I'm all ears as well. It's a great question. I would add that trauma is always um, something that is considered. It's There's not necessarily like a straight line um, like a cause causal line trauma then leads to eating disorder. There is a high correlation with, um, with the experience of, of trauma and the later development of an eating disorder. I, I'm going to add to what you said, which I thought was a great answer, um, that this is another gap in our field. And unfortunately there's so much we don't know because for so long, food insecurity wasn't considered to be a factor in eating disorders. And even beyond that, individuals who were not affluent were not considered to be people who could develop eating disorders. And they certainly weren't in the study populations, which were usually college students. So it, there aren't going to be, you know, these screening tools that, you know, were developed in the 80s aren't going to have anything about food insecurity because it simply wasn't in the consciousness of the researchers that were looking into eating disorders at that time. So hopefully someone listening here is working on their PhD and wants to come up with a screening tool that is more, uh, let's say, inclusive. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, being on your committee. <laughs> It'd be a great dissertation. <laughs> Um, we have a couple more questions, and I'm going to run through a few of these here. Um, so this is an interesting one. Um, you know, you talked about you, there, there were some questions that you wish that a provider would ask, have asked you some things. So how can we, um, you know, what are the questions here, are the questions you have in the screenings um, appropriate? that to not produce shame, but to get the conversation going and, and let um, the client know that it's safe to talk about this touchy subject. So the, is the question kind of like how to frame those, how to frame those questions? I think it could be how to bring up those questions and also how to, um, uh, you know, how, how do you, how do you provide those questions in a way that it, it's, it's not shame-based? Mm -hmm. Um, so here's where I like to pull from, um, uh, some of my background using emotion focused family therapy. And, um, so, and I like the, so the structure is, um, validating 
that emotional experience first and foremost, that I imagine how scary this has to be sitting here with, because really, truly to an eating disorder. And I'm, I'm, um, intentionally separating the eating disorder and the individual to the eating disorder. We're terrifying. We, we represent, um, you know, uh, we're a threat. And so, uh, validating, I imagine how, how scary this has to be sitting here and talking about this, how vulnerable would have, and so validating that emotional experience and, and knowing, um, and, you know, knowing that they're, there's a limit to what they're going to be able to talk about. And um, so it's kind of setting that stage, asking, not necessarily asking like really clinically focused questions necessarily, especially if this is the very first time that you're talking to somebody. Um, when I was working on uh, an admissions team for an eating disorder treatment center, um, my, my initial question was, tell me what's going on. Uh, and just kind of opening, opening up the field to just hearing what they had to say. And that helped me kind of guide the conversation a little bit further. I don't know if anybody else on the hub team has anything that you would add to that. I may want to jump in. Um... Crystal or Jessica or anybody? I would add to, um, this is where the use of metaphor. So if you, um, if you, this is my fangirl moment. Again, I do this all the time of Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani. Um, she uses a lot of metaphor. And so that can be really helpful. She ha has quite a, quite a few, if you just go on YouTube and you can search for her metaphors, it can be helpful in normalizing some of those experiences and some of those things that people might not necessarily know to, to bring out. Um, and so using some of those metaphors, using narrative stories um, can help to connect with patients and clients in a little bit different way. There's been some good conversation uh, in chat, both some questions and, and some of the hub team members answering, but I'm going to bring up a couple more here. Um, one of them is... Um, Talking about implementing uh, a 504 or other accommodations and supports in schools in Alaska, this person says, as an occupational therapist, we work in both areas and see lots of problems eating, but resources and multidisciplinary teams are hard to coordinate. And um, I'm just going to also, before you respond to that, if I can find uh, Keegan's response, says that I have found the 504 to be helpful. I have a few clients with eating schedules and breaks in their school plan. I have done supportive coaching with clients in the school setting during lunch and snacks. It's challenging though, because the shortage of staff. And I think I'll just throw that back out about 504s. And I just wanna say that can be um, very helpful for the team to have a wellness coach included um, because we can actually go in and do some of this supportive care and advocate for the client and the family and be, be in communication with the other team members as well. And just to go back to the question about what you would have liked to have the providers ask you when you were going through it, I can kind of relate to that. And the two questions that always pop up to me are Jessica said next, what she brought in her boot camp, were two questions that you know any provider can can ask is, you know, are you comfortable with your eating? And then the second question is you know, how is your eating different when you're alone? And I think those two questions right there can open up a lot of conversation. And then you can kind of start to walk that line of the behavior change and, and motivational interviewing. So uh, the, the organization that I work for, I'm really trying to encourage clinicians and case managers to really start to open that dialogue up just so we can get clients to talk. Because as we all know, this is a very secretive disease and we do need to ask these questions to get that conversation started. And I have found from personal experience to having a 504 plan for my loved one, uh, the school district here in Juneau has been very supportive um, keeping that plan in place. So, 
Um, he was brought back from being inpatient at Children's Hospital to here in Juneau, where we did outpatient all on our own. So we had very strict rules when he returned back to school. Um, you know, no recess, snack times, lunch support. And the school did what they can. I had to go there and also be part of the process. But um, now I can kind of help clients with create these 504 plans. And with our limited resources, they are happening. But I think that's it's great if we could get more, um, more support in the schools even if it's through having these health coaches and wellness services provided. Great. There are a couple of questions about how to um, do the screening for um, children and teens. And Dr. Koyar has some great um, uh, response, a really good response for, the, for this. But there's also a question about, um, would you request a parent or caregiver to be present for an 18 year old in their first year of college when doing telemedicine visits. And it could be telehealth visits. I guess it kind of depends on, well, the, the 18 year old would need to sign a release of information. And it also depends on the, um, that particular family dynamic. Um, and so I guess my Truly, my answer would be it kind of depends. It depends on um, a lot of different factors. And what we know is that uh, the inclusion of loved ones, whether that's family, friends, whomever the caregivers, whomever the, the individual is most connected to and most supported by is essential and, um, and leads to a better prognosis for recovery. Great. And Dr. Cuellar, do you want to comment um, any more on the question about um, in regards to um, parents of a child or teen, how do you include or exclude the parent from the clinical, clinical interview and discuss with the parent before the appointment, all in one room together? Your comments are great, but I thought it might be good to just address the whole group if you could do that. Yeah, um, like I said in there, I think Setting that expectation from the beginning kind of prevents that jarring uh, surprise if you're trying to do a kind of mid-visit and say, oh, we're going to have you step out of the room or step away from the camera. So um, so for me, like, I just from the start say, you know, we're going to talk together, then we'll have the opportunity to talk alone. And I also offer this to the parent, too, because they often have a lot to say with the patient outside of the room. Um, and then, you know, also acknowledging that at the end, we are going to come back together and answer your questions and create the plan together. Um, and, you know, I think in doing it this way, I haven't had as much resistance as when I used to not remember to preface this at the beginning. And then people are like, why do you want to talk alone? Um, and I think it also gives the opportunity for the team to open up a bit more. So if they know they're going to talk to you later, it prevents having that back and forth circular arguments between mom, like, no, I didn't do that. I didn't say that. And then once they leave, then that's when they tell you, like, no, I don't agree with whatever our parents said. Um, so, you know, I think they also acknowledge that that takes time. So, um, you know, in shorter visit time, sometimes we'll say, you know, we're going to talk all together now, but at a future visit, set that expectation. If you don't have time in that visit, that at some point you're going to talk to that patient alone. Okay, thank you. Another question is, um, how should we make sense of the recent rise in eating disorders amongst boys and men? Um, my, my husband asked me that question this afternoon as I was going through this with him. Um, my estimation is that part of it is because the, the social context and, of, and the conversation about eating disorders has changed the more we advocate uh, that it is not as a gender specific, specifically, you know, female specific um, illness, that the more uh, boys and men are starting to, um, to kind of come forward. There's been a significant amount of advocacy work and research that's done that um, is encouraging uh, support for men and, um, and I also think the uh, opening opening the doors to mental health to to men is having that increase has been a, has been a significant change too. I don't know if anybody else has anything to add to that. I 
I think um, these are all such great questions. Um, and there's so much to talk about. We could fill up the entire time. I think with just I mean, these conversations, with screening, the assessments, the conversations with the clients, with the family members. Um, but we're actually going to um, start wrapping this up um, because it's been a great dialogue and, and this portion certainly will be um, recorded and many people have asked for the resources. So we will um, make those available online afterwards. Um, I wanted now, we'll move into our, um, and so thank you, Dr. O'Neill, for this, this terrific uh, presentation tonight. And um, what I'd like to do is uh, move on to our case presentation. And I'm going to pass this on to Jenny Loudon, who is a 